Welcome to the first U.S. History Lecture um, on video. Now, what we'll be looking at for this first unit is westward expansion. Now, the purpose of this video lecture is to introduce the topic of westward expansion, as well as the major overarching ideas that we'll be looking at um, as we progress through this unit in my class. Now, for the students I have who are watching this video, I do recommend you take notes and perhaps use those notes um, that you take as well as other notes that you take from readings and expand off of them as, you pro as we progress through the unit. Essentially the idea is, is that after this introductory lecture, everything before the test, you know, activities, worksheets, workstations, writing prompts, etc. Um, all these seek to build off this initial introduction and work through a body of knowledge that's important to this class. Alrighty, let's get into it. Now there are two distinct phases of westward expansion, uh, the first being that traditional Oregon Trail era, you know, and the other being, well, after the Civil War. Um, basically the first is kind of endeavor of the early 1800s, um, with notable events like, you know, the Louisiana Purchase, the Homestead Act of 1862. It had settlers coming out west, not really in large numbers, but in many cases as homesteaders seeking farmland. Now this brought out some people out west. It inspired the stories of pioneers. This was not the main success of westward expansion. Rather, it's the discovery of gold in California with the 1849ers, or 49ers for short, uh, this is what started bringing people out in large numbers uh, from the east to the western United in the United States of America. Now, this re this unit of study is rather important um, for my students, at least both academically and regionally. Um, I teach in a western state, um, one of those so-called flyover states. Um, well, I don't think of them that way, but um, that's place for you. Uh, but with our curriculum, we're more concerned with Western expansion on a personal level, uh, especially when we get to the later portions of this unit. We're going to get into topics like the Black Hills Gold Rush. Um, some of the names that students hear are relatives. Um, many of these are places that they've been to or things, events that they've heard of. This is where U.S. History II intersects with local history. It's why in our history class we actually start with westward expansion, even though our textbook would really rather have us start with the Industrial Revolution. Um, westward expansion is the history of the people living where we are. Uh, this is the story of the great state of South Dakota, or South Dakota is a part of it. Now, in our textbook, what this amounts to, uh, we had to do a bit of custom crafting to make the textbook fit in with what our curriculum is looking at. What we're looking at in the textbook are topics 6.3, 10.1, and 10.2. Um, if we look at those in the book, what that amounts to is 6.3 is entitled America Achieves Manifest Destiny, essentially kind of looking at the California Gold Rush and what starts getting people really coming out west in large numbers. And then we're going to look at 10.1, American Indians Under Pressure. There will also be 10.2, the West is Transformed. And then we're also going to throw in some local South Dakota history and more emphasis on Native American history of the tribes of the Great Plains, especially those located in what is now known as South Dakota. Now you can already see that um, the textbook is kind of crafting a larger narrative, which essentially says that this portion of U.S. history is a clash of uh, civilizations. You have the more nomadic tribes of the Native Americans conflict, um, conflicting with the agricultural, industrialized society of the American settlers. Uh, for South Dakotans, this is kind of the origin story of where our state comes from and a little bit on the people who were in it, who came to live in this state. Um, but let's dive into the presentation now. Uh, we've got four major um, learning objectives uh, in here. Uh, they are as follows. Uh, analyze the impact of mining and railroads on settlement of the West. Uh, 
We're also going to explain the impact of physical and human geographic factors on settlements of the Great Plains. Uh, we're also going to look at the treatment of Chinese immigrants and Mexican Americans out west. And we're going to discuss the ways various groups use land in the west and the conflicts amongst them. Um, these two actually tie in quite closely together, uh, but I'll talk about that a bit further on. But, um, so if you're a student of one of my classes, I do recommend that you keep an eye on these objectives, maybe copy them down into your notes or copy them down, them down in your own words. Because as we're working our way through this, this lecture video or the activities that we're doing, uh, these ideas are going to come up time and time again because of the core ideas of this uh, unit. You might even be able to build some sort of like spider web of information on it if you're into that kind of note taking. Um, I am developing some videos on note taking as well, which you may find helpful. Anyways, um, next thing you're going to notice right here is we've got some key terms. Uh, I'm still trying to figure out the best place to put key terms, but I figure the start is a pretty good spot. Um, now the idea behind these key terms, many of them are pulled from the textbook, um, but they're concepts, terms, sometimes people or places that are important to our understanding of the unit or the time period. Um, these ones on in this presentation, these are the ones we're going to be focusing on in my class specifically. So you may notice that the short the list is shorter or slightly different from the version that you see in our, well, lovely textbook. Um, but So to help my students out, there is links to Quizlet or the online textbook if you want to look them up in the textbook as well. Um, and there may be one down in the description of this video, a link to those things as well. Uh, it's my recommendation for the students of my class that you pause the video here and take a look at some of these terms uh, in Quizlet or in the textbook, look them up. Now personally, how I would handle these is you are given the definitions. Um, I would take time to write these definitions out. Uh, some people like flashcards for that kind of thing. Um, some people prefer to copy them down. Um, whatever style works for you. Personally, what I do with these terms is in their individual units, they're kind of nice, but how I like to look at them is or reorganizing the terms into a way that I understand them. Personally, how I did this is I mentally thought about them as fitting into three categories. Uh, we've got people, um, pl uh, economics, and then government policy slash laws. Uh, that's kind of how these three things uh, break up. Um, that's how I sort them. So students, or as I prefer to call them in class, a bunch of turkeys. Uh, you pause the video, sort out the terms, take a moment, make sure you have these terms down because if they aren't covered in this lecture, you will be learning about them in the coming um, unit. Hmm? Oh. You're back. Um, presumably you're back. Um, right. So... Where was I? So, now the goal of these lectures is to not recall the whole speech, my whole spiel verbatim. Rather, it's to take in information, mentally organize that knowledge, and make it so that you can theoretically draw upon it in future use. Now, the rest of this lecture breaks down as follows. What brings people west, what brings those settlers west, and two is looking at the conflicts that we're going to see out west amongst different groups. Um, but, so, anyways, scrolling on down, you'll regard our lovely sod house. Sod housing was the optimal construction method during the homesteading period. So, now, as it's been mentioned, homesteading brought a lot of people out west. Um, the Homestead Act, as you may know from the key terms, uh, essentially you give people, you give settlers a certain amount of land, 150 acres is the magic number. Um, that number comes from kind of back east. Um, that, min that much acreage, 160, is a optimal amount for a family to farm and live off of. But now, 
homesteading is primarily thought of as part of the first portion of westward expansion, so you know, Oregon Trail, the Santa Fe Trail, Mormon, etc. Um, Pre-Civil War, pre-Civil War especially, you have people focusing on getting to the coast, California and Oregon. Um, now the lands that we consider kind of the flyover states, you know, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, Montana, you know, the better states, in my opinion at least. However, these were not seen as, a, as optimal lands for settlement, especially those seeking to farm. Um, as you learn in, the, in this unit and actually during a future unit on the Dust Bowl, the Great Plains are rather unforgiving for agriculture. Um, the lands like California, they have longer growing seasons. Uh, and early homesteaders knew this. Um, that's why people went far west to the coast. And then places like Wyoming, these were backfilled over time. So if you look at the settlement of the west, it goes California, Oregon, and then much later on, Montana, South Dakota, whatnot. You'll get to see a timeline in a minute. Um, but, no. Now, if you're in U.S. History 1 in our schools, you're going to focus more on the concept of manifest destiny and kind of how we acquire the lands that are out west. Um, and especially in our textbook, they have a fondness for Texas and California. Um, but we will be focusing on the later homesteading acts, um, homesteading efforts of those coming to places that will now be known as, that are now known as South Dakota, North Dakota. But back then, for a time, were called various things such as the Dakota Territory. But, no. Now, homesteading is not easy. Uh, the challenging portion of homesteading is that it requires a lot of resources. Uh, it takes a lot of work to make those farms work. And unfortunately for pioneers and those who live in South Dakota nowadays, you know that winters can be harsh, droughts can be unrelenting, and sometimes flooding is a problem. Uh, many homesteaders failed. Uh, their lands would be combined by those who were able to make it to work work out um, and make larger land plots. Um, now homesteading, especially in the Dakota Territory, required a lot of technolo technology developments, um, especially things like the steel plow, which you notice made things much more efficient because one of the ways you can overcome poor growing seasons is, well, farm more land. Um, you also have the McCormick Reaper, which was another major development. This was a device that allowed people to um, gather things more effectively. Also, fencing is another tricky part. Um, what you'll find out is that in the Western European model of land organization, determining whose land is whose is very important. Uh, and one of the tricky parts, however, is how do you well visibly mark it on the land? Barbed wire was very popular once it was invented, invented because if you've ever been on the Great Plains, um, pretty much the only trees out there are cottonwoods growing in former, in former riverbeds, which admittedly aren't, aren't a whole lot of those, or trees planted as windbreaks. Um, but barbed wire was very popular. Now there is one story of when barbed wire was first invented, you only needed one string. Um, but nowadays, if you're out in the Dakotas, you'll see three strings of barbed wire or four strings so the animals can't slip under them or jump over them, presumably. Anyways, long story short, farming in the, the homesteading of the Dakota Territory, um, Montana and whatnot, this was a very harsh, difficult way to do it. It required lots of technology to do it. Um, I mean, if you students who have been in my classes just this past few months, um, we've had flooding, blizzards as late as May, droughts, there's always the concern of tornadoes, and even in this area you have some of the world's fastest temperature changes. Uh, homesteading is not easy. Um, the land is not always the greatest. Um, we have to consider that um, really when we get to the Industrial Revolution, this will be more apparent, but technology plays a huge role, as kind of stated before. 
Uh, before the Industrial Revolution, really the only successful way to live out on the Great Plains was to live a more nomadic lifestyle. Um, as bison have shown, as Native Americans have shown for centuries, um, dating back to prehistory, um, when the going gets tough on the Great Plains, sometimes it's easier just to go somewhere else. And that's why bison are nomadic. They eat the grass in one area. The weather gets bad. They move somewhere else. They have developed patterns. Um, the Native Americans who carve out a good living in this, in this, uh, all with the bison, realize that they have to be make their goods portable. Uh, we'll dive more into that um, in the future units. Um, but other groups that kind of first came out west, you've got fur traders, especially the French, have a number of stories. I remember growing up reading about um, French fur traders. I think in a Boy Scout magazine, Boy's Life. Um, but the first Europeans who really take off with success are mountain men, um, and we also see other groups like cowboys um, find success ranching. Uh, because essentially the idea behind ranching is, especially early open range ranching, um, we see the practices that nomads use um, only with more of a European take. Now, this is why cowboys found a lot of early success, or open-range ranching found a lot of uh, success. Uh, really what makes um, the open-range ranching different from the nomadic lifestyle of the Native Americans is um, European methods of horseback riding, the, thanks to the Columbian Exchange, um, cattle and horses are available. And so first pat practiced by the Spanish and Mexicans, uh, later, the Mexicans, the Vercueros, I'm probably mispronouncing that, I took German in college. Um, but essentially, this ranching lifestyle, open range ranching, um, used a lot of the nomadic ideas, only it did it in a distinctly kind of more European, um, or at least Western manner. Um, the Vercueros, talking more about them, um, essentially, in the Northern Territories, what we call, well, the Western United States nowadays, um, the way cattle were, were raised in the Vercuero style were, is what eventually will be used by cowboys. Um, really, the big difference between Vercueros and cowboys the, that come later on is the United States brings in railroads and makes um, cattle ranching a very viable economic method. Uh, because essentially the idea is, is thankfully due to the Industrial Revolution, there's a high demand for food. Um, and raising beef on, in places especially like Texas, um, all you have to do is move the cattle around to where the grass grows. Um, when the cattle are, are fattened and ready, you bring them down to a cow town, and the cattle are moved on train rail cars from the cow towns out west into places like Chicago, New York, and, well, supply and demand. There isn't a demand for thousands of heads of cattle out west, but there's a lot of demand for that cattle out east. However, you can't raise all those cows in the east, but you can in the west. Um, I recommend looking at supply and demand for that. Um, but really the big contribution is the U.S. takes the Vercuero model and expands it with the introduction of railroads out west. Now, unlike, unlike homesteaders, cowboys um, had a different kind of set of skills. Uh, whereas homesteaders, you need a lot of resources because you needed to bring everything in to um, uh, start your homesteading, your farming operation. Uh, cattle ranching was different. Cowboys, uh, they made up kind of uh, skilled labor force. They needed to know how to ride horses navigate difficult terrain, wield weapons to defend the herd and occasionally themselves. And often these were young, adventurous men who didn't have a lot of resources, but they had the skills. And that's what got them out west, got them working. Um, additionally, uh, thanks to the cow towns, you brought even more people out west because those cow towns um, weren't just railroad, railroad depots. They also served as places where cowboys could refit their equipments, get their saddles fixed, 
um, restock supplies, uh, maybe get treatments, um, of course visit the saloon, things like that. And so even more people are brought out west um, just to support the cowboys. Now the cowboy era is very short-lived, um, and that's partially because the open range system is, well, not necessarily the easiest system. Um, to manage because you have to keep track of your herds of cattle, so cattle rustling is always a problem. Um, people could steal your cows. But one of the things we kind of realize um, with cattle ranching is as more and more people are brought west, there's a need for more organization. And so especially with the invention of barbed wire, people began, began setting up land claims fencing off their claims versus other people's open range claims. And so the open range style kind of falls out of favor. Um, one of the other challenges that comes up is they kind of flood the east with cattle. And so thanks to supply and demand, the demand for beef drops and it becomes less profitable to raise cattle. So there's less and so there's less cattle ranching done. Uh, cattle ranching will never go away from the West. In, um, it's still around to this day. It's just that the numbers adjust and the amount of people working in that industry adjust as supply and demand kind of shifts things around. So to kind of summarize things, what ends the open range um, system for the most part is barbed wire with cheap fan fencing, Land, owning large plots of land and lots of heads of cattle uh, becomes an easier thing to do with combined. You know about the oversupply of beef. Um, also, there's also a series of very harsh winters and uh, a series of droughts. Um, and this actually creates a demand for farmers. So those homesteaders who have been holding out and hanging in there, um, they become important because they supply farmers with hay or ranchers with hay. Um, and so as a result, uh, if you've ever seen the musical Oklahoma, um, you would note that um, it was frequently farmers versus ranchers. And in this case, the farmers are propping up the ranchers with the supply of hay. And open range system isn't really that conducive to farmers because they need to be able to protect their crops and they just don't want to deal with cattle stamp stamping in. So that's kind of the other thing that kills the open range is um, this kind of struggle between ranchers and farmers. And as a result, uh, when the fence technology catches up, um, the open range becomes less efficient. Alrighty, now let's talk about what truly brought people out west, and that is gold rushes. Um, well, and mining for other things like silver, tin, um, iron, etc., etc. Uh, you'll find out why that all this mining is important in the Industrial Revolution unit. Now, what makes California state is the gold rush of 1849. Um, because really before this, it's not that European um, settlers had never come to these lands before out west. It's just that it was extremely limited. Um, the Spanish owned these lands for several hundred years with minimal settlement. Um, the Mexican government um, did not really do the most to really expand the northern territories. They invited in Americans to settle in what is now known as Texas. I'm getting into U.S. History 1 with all that. Um, but really what gets people coming out west is some changes. Uh, thanks to the Civil War, the devastation of the Civil War pushes a lot of people out of the south. Uh, with slow recon reconstruction and the fact um, that the South really isn't is was in recovery, pushed a lot of people from the South out west. Additionally, of some people from the North after the war that come out west, um, uh, which as a result, much of the West, especially in this time period, is a lot of Civil War veterans. Um, they came out west for opportunities that they may not have been able to find back east or south. Um, also, there were a number of immigrants that came out west as well. 
Uh, for example, some parts of North and South Dakota, German-speaking people settled in such high numbers that German was the preferred language of newspapers um, in some small towns as late as the 1950s. Uh, we'll talk more about immigrants later, especially later in our Industrial Revolution unit, so the unit that follows this one. But, um, what really makes mining important is before mining comes in, we don't see the numbers, but when gold is discovered in 1849, um, that's what really gets people out west. Um, also, thanks to the Transcontinental Railroad, um, people are able to get out west for much cheaper. Thanks to railroads, goods could be shipped more easily, which meant that you didn't have to pack everything into the back of a wagon and come out west. Um, which also meant that startup costs were lower, because if you didn't have to bring everything in that you needed at once, or you could buy the supplies you needed when you got there, it made life a lot easier, and so startup costs of coming out west to come mine are lower than those um, needed to, say, be a homesteader. But Kind of looking at this map here, what you'll see is California is where the gold is starting to be found first. And then it occurs to people that, hey, you know, there's a bunch of different mountain ranges and stuff over in these ways. There's bound to be some gold or something like silver, tin, iron, really any of these resources. Gold is the most beloved. Um, there's bound to be these resources back this way. And so that's why you see the first mines are popping up here, but then you also see them pop up over here, some over here. Um, when we get into the Dakota areas, uh, 1870s, uh, Colorado, there's a lot to work with with the Rockies, so that's why they're all over the place for finding mining claims. But essentially what happens is people backfill these other states uh, looking for opportunity. But... Now, the, the interesting thing about gold mining, or mining in general, is that most of these mines failed. Mining is tricky. Um, you have to find the resource, and then you have to have the tools and knowledge to extract it in a cost-effective manner. Um, if you're ever in the Black Hills, there's a lot of abandoned mines, because, sure, they found a vein or something, but maybe there wasn't much there. Um, or it was unclear how to get it out there in an effective, cost-effective manner. Um, not everyone's going to hit something like Homestake, which was in operation until about well, a decade ago. Um, mining has an extraordinarily low success rate, especially in this time period. Some people are getting rich, but this is not the majority. There's a lot of un untold stories of the miners who failed. Um, a good example of a boom town, one of those towns that pops up for mining and then disappears, well, or in this case doesn't completely disappear, is our textbook points at the example of Leadville, Colorado. Um, uh, essentially in its heyday it was the second largest city in Colorado. Nowadays it's, well, the high school that I teach at has more students in it than um, this town. Um, these boom towns really tell you where the real growth in population comes from. Um, it doesn't really matter if a miner ever succeeds in finding whatever they're looking for, whether it's gold, silver, whatever. Um, however, those miners need resources. A miner may never find gold, but they need a pan, they need a pickaxe, they need to eat, they need uh, tents, Levi making tents, uh, later jeans. Um, these miners need resources to live, um, even if they never find any gold. And so in the grand scheme of things, the people who could supply the miners are the ones who profited the most. Launderers, bankers, um, grocery store operators, uh, government workers who came out to basically organize a tax base for the West, uh, railroad employees, these are the people that you see with a bit more success out West. Um, 
thought. Entrepreneurship is very big um, in Western in Western American culture, and it's largely because of this. Uh, the gold mines largely the mines largely failed. Big corporations took over, but uh, small town innovations and services those are what kind of had success. But, um, and when these gold veins dried up, people moved on. Um, they didn't necessarily go back east. In many cases, they moved to places like Denver. And so that's why you have some big cities out west. Nothing compared to what you see in the in back east, but um, the p many people who come out west stay out west, even if they didn't start in the boom town. They finished in the boom town where they started. But, Now here's a, that chart I promised earlier of when statehood is achieved. Um, I won't go into the exact details of how a state becomes a state because that's more of a U.S. government topic. But you can kind of see here that the states, as they're being formed, they're kind of backfilling from far west further and further back east um, uh, into the Great Plains. So you'll see Nevada, uh, Nebraska was being settled before the Civil War, so it's kind of obvious that it would um, achieve statehood pretty close, pretty quick. Uh, Colorado, thanks to places like Denver. Um, then you've got almost all at once all these other places. Uh, Washington wasn't as desired as Oregon was, so that's why it came later. Montana, Big Sky came later. And you'll notice North Dakota and South Dakota come in. Um, kind of one of the fun, funny f stories about North Dakota and South Dakota is um, they were both signed in at the same time. Uh, they shuffled the papers for signing in which state came first, which came second, because they wanted it to be random. And the irony is, is no one remembered which one was signed first. So um, the exact numbering of these two states is forever unknown. Um, but as I like to joke in class, there is only one true Dakota, and that is South Dakota. Um, you've got Idaho over here, Wyoming, and one of the oddballs out here is Utah. Um, now, Utah comes later, uh, partially because it's initially settled by Mormons, and the Mormons in the U.S. government do not necessarily, necessarily see eye to eye. And so what delays their statehood is a series of negotiations between them and the U.S. government um, to ultimately form the state we now know as Utah. So that's why they're at the end. They're kind of the oddball. Most of these they fill in population-wise, and as their populations fill, they become states. In Utah's case, they may have had the population a lot earlier, but the negotiation of how they became a state was more contentious than these other ones. Anyways. Next for our last um, little bit to cover. Now... Our textbook chooses to focus more on minority groups, uh, particularly those in California. I think this is primarily because our textbook is targeted at California school districts because there's a lot of money in publishing textbooks for that. I mean students. There's a lot of students in California to sell textbooks for. Um, uh, our textbook does point out, for example, that the population out west was maybe not as big, um, maybe about 20% of the people in America, 20% of them lived out west, because most people were living in those industrializing cities at back east. That's where the work was, and so a lot of people were there. However, the west was ethnically more diverse. Uh, you had high population of Mexican Americans, essentially those Americans who um, they were Mexicans before the before the before the Mexican American War. Um, they lived in the Northern Territories, which became the Western United States. And so there's a group of Mexican-Americans who've been living here for generations, sometimes dating back to the Spanish period. Um, also, you have Mexicans who came up from Mexico later on um, looking for opportunities. Uh, there's Asian-Americans, which naturally you know how geography works. Um, California is the easiest access point and closest access point of entry. Um, and each of these groups came looking for economic opportunities, but they didn't necessarily get the same treatments, say, as wasps or white European Americans coming west. Um, we're going to talk more about immigration in our Industrial Revolution unit, uh, 
Um, but for the purpose of this unit uh, in Westford expansion, there are a couple of things I want to make sure that I cover here, um, but they'll really be detailed in more um, later on. Uh, first, to look at Chinese immigrants. Uh, many of the Chinese immigrants uh, came over to um, carry out the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, due to racism, they were often ostracized uh, frequently from other immigrants. Um, and so there were, while there are a number of Chinese who came over to work on the railroad, a number of other Chinese, much like the mining industry uh, you saw, there's a lot of Chinese who immigrated to the United States to, well, provide goods and services for the Chinese workers. Uh, that's why when you go to places like San Francisco or any major city in California, you're going to find a historic Chinatown district. Uh, because as the struggles and difficulties kind of grew, uh, newcoming immigrants would often come find immigrants who had came before them, and they developed their own unique communities. Um, Part of the reason why we don't spend as much time talking about, oh, say, Chinatowns uh, in our history class is while they're important, um, our South Dakota, South Dakota doesn't really have um, this, the, the diversity that our textbook is focusing on in quite the numbers. Uh, yes, there's archaeological evidence that uh, Chinese uh, lived in Deadwood, South Dakota, you know, from the Deadwood series or, well, the historical place, Deadwood. Um, however, the Chinatown that was located in Deadwood is an archaeological site. Um, when the railroad and various jobs were completed, um, the, Chinese, the Chinese workers for those jobs moved, and the Chinese who supplied those workers with laundry services, clothing, food, they moved too. And so, um, like the boom towns, uh, when the main workforce that's bringing the suppliers in disappears, the suppliers move on as well. But the other group that's um, worth mentioning is the Mexican Americans. Um, the Mexican Americans lived in the Northern Territories, so we're talking about mainly California and the Southwest primarily. Um, they often suffered problems with that their land was redistributed. Um, Mexican Americans, uh, deriving partially from more from more Spanish Hispanic Spanish culture, they had different concepts of land ownership that did not really mesh up cleanly with the U.S. Um, U.S. legal system. Um, Mexican Americans often owned their lands lived in communities that owned their lands collectively, which the U.S. legal system had troubles processing, especially in this time period. Um, also was not helped by the regard that um, Mexican Americans were often held lower uh, in regard to their race and religion. Um, so they were often discriminated by Americans back east, and some of those Americans coming east practiced, well, the same amount of discrimination. Um, the major legal document is the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, but that's really a topic more for U.S. History 1. But if you're curious about why these cultural clashes kind of come up, um, you might want to look at differing concepts of land ownership, especially for the Mexican Americans. So now we're going to look at, um, so our textbook focuses on the diversity that particularly impacts places like California, uh, Nevada, and whatnot. The diversity that really impacts um, places like South Dakota, North Dakota, Wyoming, um, especially South Dakota, is the Native Americans out west. Um, so that's why we kind of rebuild this topic in our in our classroom. Is the Native Americans that we're talking about? Um, the textbook glazes over them in a very short section. We're going to spend more time on it here in our class. Um, with the Native Americans that we're speaking of, because we need to be a bit more specific, um, we're mainly referring to the tribes collectively referred to as the Sioux. Um, these varying tribes, um, they all developed uh, in the Great Plains area over the centuries. Um, and they have a distinctly different lifestyle than, say, the Anasazi, the Iroquois, or the Cherokee. Um, the, 
Native Americans of the Great Plains developed their own a different culture from what we see further east or even further west or south. Um, what we see with the tribes of the Great Plains is they had developed and refined a nomadic lifestyle that best suited the Great Plains in the pre-industrialized era, um, as detailed before and as you'll hear about more. Um, and in, this, in the time period, well, during and a bit before westward expansion, they had rapidly incorporated horses, guns, and other technologies into their nomadic lifestyle. Um, in U.S. History 1, it's talked about a bit more, but during the American Civil War, there's a secondary conflict going on, um, the, referred to as the Indian Wars. Uh, these were six, a series of conflicts, uh, massacres, battles, um, and disputes over resources out west. Um, competition for the same land is what kind of drives a lot of these conflicts. Um, how different groups want to use the different land um, is what drives a lot of the conflict out west. But uh, the American bison sought to use the same land that was being fenced off for grazing or the land that ran ranchers and farmers sought to use. Um, one of the other things that really drives the conflict, it's something that might be kind of overlooked by many, um, but it's also a conflict of cultures. European Americans, or whites as many refer to them as, uh, come from a radically different uh, cultural background than those that developed in the Great Plains. Um, while the Indian Wars would end like the open conflicts, there are disputes that continue. Um, the U.S. government, uh, as we're going to learn in this unit with things like the Dawes General Allotment Act, um, we're going to see that the U.S. government develops more and more controlling, legalistic, um, and as the Bureau of Indian Affairs admitted a few years ago, racist management policy over the tribes out west. Um, through things like violence, uh, intentional or not, misunderstandings abound in diplomacy and imperialism, Native Americans of the Great Plains would be organized into reservations, um, the reservations as we know them now today. And so this last section that I'm talking about is, there's a lot going on in this section, and especially for the people, the students of my class, this is the world that they're going to be, they're learning the foundation of the world they live in today, the local world that they live in. Um, but... I think the last thing this chart wants to show is kind of the diversity of people living out west, um, which kind of shows you that there's a lot of different groups trying to carve out a living out here. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that we're going to see in this unit is there's different ways of trying to make a living. Um, and the west western expansion period is a period of change. So... Um, I do sincerely hope that this lecture video is helpful for students. In the upcoming lessons, we're going to expand on a lot of the ideas outlined here. Um, some of the activities, we'll look at gold mining. Uh, we'll look at things uh, like the Black Hills Gold Rush, the Dodge General Allotment Act, um, and other things as well. Um, so it's my recommendation that students, um, now that this video is almost over, uh, take a look at the slides. Uh, you'll notice that um, my presentation, what I'm talking about, doesn't, not everything, not, not everything matches up cleanly, um, but that's because I'm not here to read slides, I'm here to present information. So I recommend afterwards you take a look at the slides. I'll also include a transcript of um, what I talked about. And with all that being said, that's it. Um, until later.